they are the fastest, the largest and the most dangerous in the world. They conquer every terrain and they overcome borders. This is a very challenging thing to, um, to bring out a new ship like this. But it is much more than a challenge. It's absolutely a privilege to be here and do this. Their design goes beyond the scope of what is technologically possible, setting new standards. These vehicles are milestones of engineering. This is the father of air travel. On land, on water, and in the air, all of them are ultimate vehicles. The Leopard 2, for many experts, the perfect compromise of armor, mobility, and firepower. Also in this episode, the most dreaded tank of the Second World War. And the world's safest tank, the Israeli Merkava 4. No other model was produced more frequently, the T-54-55. And finally, one of the most versatile military vehicles in the world, the CV-90. It is considered effective, precise, cutting edge and nearly invincible. The Leopard 2, the most legendary battle tank in the world. The Leopard 2 has been in production since 1979. 18 countries around the world count on its strength. Its battle weight is about 63 tons. The primary weapon, a 120 mm smoothbore gun. Germany, Augustdorf, home of the German Army's 21st Tank Brigade. The most recent version of the Leopard, the A7, has been used here since 2015. 11 meters long, about four meters wide, and two and a half meters high. It has a 1,500 horsepower engine and is equipped with the latest technology. Today is exam day in Augustdorf. At the live fire area, 20 tank gunner trainees must show what they have learned in the past weeks. So far, the trainees have only shot in a simulator. Today, things get real for Lance Corporal Nicholas and Dirk. Only when both perform well will their training continue. You're nervous, but also excited. There's been a lot of talking, but now you can take it as it comes. It's all timed, and I'm a bit worried that I won't see the targets in time, and then won't have enough time to engage. But it should actually be no problem. Captain Philip is company operations officer and is leading today's exercise. From his command tower, he radios the assignments to the trainees. In my view, the Leopard is one of the best battle tanks in the world. It's easy to use in all operational modes and phases. How easy it really is will emerge momentarily. The Leopard 2 has a four-man crew. The driver sits in front on the right. The loader sits on the left side of the tower. This position is filled today by Lance Corporal Dirk. The gunner sits above the driver and mans the weapons. Today, it's Lance Corporal Nicholas. The commander sits above him. Now, the exercise begins. Thanks to its fluid-cooled 12-cylinder engine with two turbochargers and an impressive 47.6-litre displacement, the Leopard 2 can reach speeds of up to 70 kilometers per hour. 60% gradients and three-meter-wide ditches are no problem for this German-manufactured tank.
The exam includes so-called hard targets in the form of old tank wrecks and moving discs. In the tower, company operations officer Captain Philip and his team prepare for the exercise. He gives his orders over the radio. Uh, bravo, bravo, attack. Alpha, surveillance. Position 1-2, move forward. Over. The first target, the old tank wreck. They're shooting with practice ammunition. It does not explode upon impact, but emits a bright flash of light. Fire. Hit. Center. Seven seconds. Hit. Target center. A direct hit with a very first shot. The trainers are satisfied. Very good. The next target, one of the moving discs. As opposed to older models, the 2A7 can also shoot so-called high-explosive ammunition. It does not explode automatically upon impact. Instead, the timing of the explosion can be programmed beforehand. This shot is also a hit. Bravo, now reverse, go. The next test, shooting while moving. While moving in reverse, that is. The Leopard can go 31 kilometers an hour like this. Hit. Deep. Nine seconds. That even inexperienced gunners can hit a target while moving is thanks to the Leopard 2's electronic weapon slaving and stabilization system. The sights through which the gunner aims at the target are mounted on stabilizers that compensate for the tank's movements. Thus, he can keep the target in sight despite the rough terrain. The sights and the laser rangefinder are hooked up to the tank's ballistic computer. This computer combines the information about the sighted target with parameters like the vehicle's own speed and wind speed, thus calculating the weapon's optimal position and adjusting it automatically. Should parts of the system go offline, the Leopard 2 can still shoot. To keep everything functioning perfectly, the tanks must be regularly serviced. The Armoured Corps Training Centre in Munster. Here, soldiers learn how to operate the 63-ton steel colossus. This is also one of the 52 support locations of the Army Logistics Service provider. The Leopard 2s are regularly checked and serviced in these halls. Sergeant Major Michael Helmrich is the Armed Forces Shooting Advisor. The basic idea behind the Leopard 2 was to significantly improve the performance of the Leopard 1. The Leopard 1 was the first German battle tank after World War II. It was much more agile and faster than the American tanks the armed forces had previously used. In addition, it had a more powerful gun and was the first tank with a weapon stabilization system, which made it possible to shoot while moving. There were two essential considerations. First, the existing armor had to be strengthened. Second, and more importantly, a fire control system had to be improved. The origin of the Leopard 2 is a joint tank project from the 1960s between Germany and the United States. Due to the long development time of about 15 years, including 16 prototypes, it was possible to resolve problems ahead of time that otherwise would have cropped up in normal use. Since then, the Leopard 2 has been regularly upgraded with new technology. The armor has been continually improved, the weapon system modernized, a stronger cannon added, and numerous new digital systems integrated. Thus, the hull of the current version, the A7, is even better protected against mines and IEDs, 
and the side armor can be strengthened with additional track skirts depending on the operational area. At the live fire area in Augustdorf, the exam is still in progress. Bravo, command here. Hard target, double bridge, left. The gunner trainee, Lance Corporal Nicholas, now has about 15 seconds to find and hit the target. Tactically, the exam was good. The hits will be evaluated soon. Today, the trainee shot at a real tank for the first time. It was really loud. Smelt strange, but was pretty good. From inside, the gunner doesn't really notice much. We still want to know whether the two trainees have passed their exam. Bravo crew, assemble. Today's upshot, everyone passed. It was great, indeed better. Good work, dismissed. In the next months, the two soldiers will continue their training with the most legendary tank in the world. Later in this episode, the Israeli Merkava 4. It is an exotic tank, departing from the usual basic design. This heavyweight puts especially high value on protecting its crew. World War II was the age of grand tank battles. One of the most dreaded among them, the German Armored Fighting Vehicle 6, known as the Tiger I. It is one of the most legendary tanks of World War II, a steel beast. Dreaded by its enemies, it is unique for its myth of invincibility, the German Tiger I. The Nazis put the tank in the field in the autumn of 1942. Only 1,500 were produced in total. It was dreaded by all on account of its 88mm gun. One specimen is in Great Britain, more precisely, in Bovington. This is home to the world's largest tank museum. The collection is unique. Over 300 armoured combat vehicles are here. Curator and tank expert David Willey has the overview. For him, it is clear that the Tiger had above all strategic significance for the Germans. Obviously, there was a, a fear factor because the tank was so big, so powerful, it could outrange pretty much any Allied tank when it first appears. The Steel Colossus is nearly 8.5 meters long, over 3.5 meters wide, and weighs 57 tons. That made it up to 20 tons heavier than all of its opponents on the battlefield. Up to 10 centimeters of steel made the tank nearly impenetrable to enemy fire. When introduced, it was the most powerful tank of its day. With a 700 horsepower V12 engine, the heavyweight could achieve a cross-country speed of 20 kilometers per hour. On paved roads, the Tiger could go twice as fast. But this was reflected in fuel consumption. Every 100 kilometers, the Tiger consumed about 540 liters of fuel. But its built-in weapons technology was also expensive. Many say too expensive. But it is precisely this technology that made the Tiger so special. So the sighting arrangements, that in combination with that 88 millimeter, tremendously powerful gun, you're firing uh, an armor-piercing round which can pretty much go through any known tank when this comes into service late 42, early 43. The Tiger is a veritable sharpshooter. At a distance of up to 1,500 meters, it could destroy every target. The tank's gun is especially noteworthy. At 4.93 meters, it was the longest of the time and at 1.6 tons, also the heaviest. Its .88 caliber bore was also unmatched, and with 92 shells on board, the Tiger became a legend on the battlefield, thanks as well to its 10 centimeter thick armor. On paper, the Tiger was superior to all other tanks, but too often the Tiger remained immobile due to technical problems. And just quite simply, it was put together in a rush 
So there was lots of teething troubles, lots of early mistakes, things breaking down, the gearbox had it was struggling, the engine to, to match that 56 tonnes, it was originally designed for 30 tonnes, so there's a, a series of issues they try and out, iron out during the production run. The Tiger was its own worst enemy. Technical problems accumulated, and many of the heavyweights simply got stuck in Russia's difficult terrain. One of the tanks survived the war. It is now here in this museum. After months of inactivity, today it is supposed to drive again. If anyone knows every screw, every one of even the smallest of this 70-year-old tank's parts, then it is Mike Hayton. We've got the only working one in the world, and um, it's a hard job to keep it in the condition that we like to keep it in. So it's always a challenge to me. Um, all of these grey hairs on my head are due to the tiger. Also here today, Mike's team of mechanics. Sorry. In addition, a fan is here to fulfil a lifelong dream, to drive a real tiger. But will it start? There is barely room inside the tank for the five members of the crew. But Eric Schneider, the tank fan, is overwhelmed. Well, it's really nice. It feels a little um, claustrophobic, but it's nice. And sometimes the crew had to persevere inside the tank for days and weeks. To get the tank started, Mike first has the two heavy battery cells reinstalled. Then he attends to a special feature. This Tiger was deployed in Tunisia before being captured by British troops. To counter the hot and dusty conditions, this Tiger was equipped with a special filter. It has what they call a FIFA air, air filtering system. So the system behind me filters the air before it gets to the engine air filters. And every time we lift the deck, we have to dismantle it so that we can get access. Under the hood, a Maybach V12 is slumbering. But the 21-litre engine has its problems. Besides its tremendous fuel consumption, the engine's need for oil required the crew to make sure there were always enough reserves on board. This led to supply problems at the front. Mike checks the fuel level twice, just to make sure. So we have this much fuel in the tank, so that's, that's enough to run it today. Now, the preparations are complete, and the big moment approaches the Tiger is going to drive. With every passing minute and every action of his crew, Mike Hayton's nervousness increases. We try to take every precaution we can, and there's still the unknown. Um, for example, last year we, uh, we tried to start it for Tank Fest on the inertia starter, and it broke. So we had to take the engine out at, um, during the winter and repair that. This could happen today too, of course. Under his direction, the mechanics pull the beast out of the hall. Now, ignition is only a few minutes away. So, next one, turn the engine over a couple of times. Uh, we need the fuel turned on first. Like an old propeller airplane, the Tiger can also be started mechanically. Try again. Only when there is enough oil pressure can the tank be started with a crank. Wait, is that full choke? Should have gone by now. Yeah. Yeah, try again, Darren. Oil pressure, OK. Finally, after months of standing still, the Tiger once again moves under its own power. Admittedly, somewhat hesitantly, but the chains are clattering slowly across the museum grounds. Only a small observation slit lets the driver see anything. Yeah, change into fourth gear, Darren. The beast that spread fear and panic on the battlefields of World War II moves forward slowly but surely. The 57 tons of steel creak with every movement, but Mike's meticulous work pays off, and the Tiger finally stands at its new location.
You know, for me, it's always very stressful because, you know, we never want to break it. And so we try and do as much as we can to, to make sure we don't blow up. The German Tiger I in Bovington is the only one that can still drive under its own power after more than 70 years. A true ultimate vehicle. Later in this episode, mass production instead of technical sophistication. The T-54-55 was the standard tank in the Eastern Bloc and became the most produced tank in the world. Since the Second World War, basic tank design has almost always been the same. There are only two exceptions, and one of them is our next ultimate vehicle. This tank is considered the safest in the world. The Israeli Army's Merkava Mark IV. Tested in numerous battles, experts rank it as one of the best tanks in the world. The Mark IV variant of the Merkava tank has been in production since 2003. Its combat weight is 65 tons. Its high speed is 64 kilometers an hour. Its primary weapon is a 120 mm smooth bore tank gun. Israel, the Golan Heights near the Syrian border. Today, the Israeli army will carry out a large scale tank combat exercise here. At about 8 meters long, 2.5 meters high, and 3.7 meters wide, the Merkava is one of the largest tanks. And, due to its extremely strong armor, is also one of the heaviest. The rear door provides a safe exit in case of emergency. Its armament packs an extremely powerful punch. A total of 15 tanks are participating in today's exercise. Each Merkava 4 has a four-man crew, the commander, the gunner, the loader signaler and the driver. First Lieutenant Menachem Klavan is the commander of this tank. For him and his crew, this exercise is the last part of their training before they're stationed in the border zone. In this exercise in the Golan Heights, we're playing through various battle scenarios. We train for every possible situation and in every season. We don't know what awaits us when we're deployed. So, we have to train and be prepared for everything. The soldiers have been at combat readiness for one hour. Headquarters could give the command to begin the exercise at any moment. Inside the tank, the soldiers check the systems and electronics again. Each man has his own screen to control and monitor the functions relevant to his job. The Merkava Mark IV is the best tank in Israel right now, probably the best in the world. When I sit in it, it feels like I'm in my own car. All the safety features give you the feeling that the tank protects you once you're inside. For defense against guided missiles and armor-piercing shells, the Merkava 4 also has a state-of-the-art electronic defense system called Trophy. A radar with four antennas recognizes threats from all sides. Within milliseconds, the system calculates the trajectory, distance, speed and anticipated impact time of the incoming weapon. Right before the weapon would hit the Merkava, a neutralizing charge is fired that destroys the projectile while it is still in the air. The order has been given to start the exercise. The Merkava 4 has a V12 diesel engine with 1500 horsepower. It drives on continuous track without pads. The track is extremely robust and can even handle rocky terrain without braking easily. At the beginning of the exercise, the tanks take a position on a ridge. 
I don't know what's coming next or what the trainers have prepared. That's part of the exercise, just like on a real battlefield. We're here to practice what it's like not to know what's going to happen. Using the digital battlefield management system, the commander visualizes the target position on a screen. Now, it's up to the gunner. Seven types of ammunition can be fired from the 120 millimeter tank gun. Its range, over 3,000 meters. After attacking from a distance, the tanks advance, using the ridge as cover. Despite its heavy weight, the Merkava 4 can drive up to 64 kilometers an hour. The tank crew's job is now to form the rear guard and provide support for the company. Tel Aviv, Tel Hashomir base, one of Israel's largest military bases. Home to a unit whose mission is to constantly improve tank and vehicle development. One of the engineers is Major R. For security reasons, his real name cannot be used. His task, to make the Merkava, which was developed in the 1970s, even safer and even better. Back then, it was difficult for Israel to buy tanks from other countries, so we decided to build our own tank in Israel. The basic idea was to build a tank tailor-made for our troops. First, we focus on the men and build a tank around them. The tank's capabilities are adapted to the needs of the troops. Planning for the Merkava began in the early 1970s. The goal, a tank perfectly designed for the Israeli army's tactics and areas of operation. The first tanks were delivered to units in 1979. In the 1970s, the biggest challenge was to build a tank with no prior experience. The decision was made to have the various parts made by several Israeli companies. Based on experience in the field, the Israelis continuously improved the tank. This also goes for the current model, the Mark IV. Ever since it was first designed seven years ago, the tank has been upgraded and improved. The idea is to adapt the tank to a system that changes daily. Studies and initial tests for an even more modern and effective version of the Merkava, the Mark V, have been underway since 2015. Meanwhile, in the Golan Heights, the units have approached to within a half kilometer of their target. The tank crew's job is now to secure the flanks and to provide covering fire for the advancing foot soldiers. The Merkava 4 is perfectly equipped for this too. In addition to its main gun, it has four machine guns for engaging short-range targets. To discover threats immediately, Four cameras are mounted on the Merkava, providing the crew with a panoramic 360-degree view. After a good two and a half hours, the mission is complete. The target has been taken and surrounded. Commander Menachem Klavan is happy with how the exercise has gone. It went very well, although it was a challenge. But now, we're ready for every possible scenario. Undoubtedly thanks in part to the knowledge that they are sitting in the safest tank in the world.
Also in this episode, the CV-90 Infantry Fighting Vehicle. It was already considered one of the most modern in the world, but it has now been improved once again for the Norwegian Army. The Merkava 4 is used by precisely one country. The next ultimate vehicle was used around the world, from Siberia to Southern Africa. For decades, they have been performing their task as the workhorse of armored corps all over the world. Tanks from the T-54, T-55 series. Equipped with the most modern technology of their time, for over 30 years, they were the standard tank for the Soviet Union and their allies, and they are still used in some countries. In total, over 100,000 tanks of this kind were produced between 1946 and 1983. Its combat weight, 40 tons. Its armament, a 100 mm gun. Benneckenstein in the Harz Mountains. The T-55's theater of operations in Germany, today only in a museum. The museum has numerous military vehicles and tanks that can be booked for private rides. The biggest star among them, a T-55 from Poland. In Mario Tensa and Marcel Koenig's tank driving school, this T-55 has found its final calling. For 300 euros, enthusiasts can drive the tank for about half an hour. This once modern tank, however, is slowly showing its age. It was built in 1972 and needs a lot of maintenance. It's an old lady continually beset by malfunctions. When the T-55 was chiefly used in the 1960s and 1970s, it was a modern weapon system. In order to buy the tank, however, Mario Tensa had to remove all its weapons technology. The engine, on the other hand, is still original. Before Mario Tensa can start the tank, he must preheat it. In order to go easy on the powerful but therefore sensitive engine, it had to be preheated even when it was used in combat conditions. Of course it's very special to drive with its 40-litre engine and its enormous power. It's quite a big deal. Originally, the T-55 had a four-man crew. Except for the seats for the driver and commander, however, everything has been removed from this model. The T-55 is so robust that even today, 70 years later, it continues to be used in local conflicts, especially in Africa. Mario Tensa, however, is not very happy with his tank at the moment. Did you see? It didn't turn. It turns poorly. There's oil everywhere. And it shifts poorly too. With its unladen weight of 37 tons, the T-55 is a small and agile tank. This is what made it so beloved in its time. It is armed with a 100 mm cannon, its rate of fire up to seven shells per minute, its maximum range two and a half kilometers. The T-55 is as wide as other tanks of the time but it is lower and thus makes for a more difficult target. The round, cast tower averts shells better than in earlier tanks. In addition, the T-55 was prized for its simple and robust suspension. Unique for a tank, the distance between the first and the second wheel. The idea was to reduce the damage caused by mines and at the same time to improve maneuverability. The tank driving school's terrain is no challenge for the T-55. 
It has a maximum gradeability of 60% and can handle lateral slopes of 30%. In addition, it was the first tank to be able to cross waterways up to four and a half meters deep. After 15 minutes, Mario Tensa and Marcel Koenig have completed their test drive, but they do not look at all pleased. During this short test drive, I got two blisters just from shifting, since the gears are so unsynchronized. And in one bend, we simply went straight, which means that sometimes we have hydraulic pressure and sometimes we don't. Inspecting the engine for problems. Here it's all oily. A somewhat bigger repair job. Oil is shooting out of the side of the engine's fan propeller. You can see it really well here. This part is covered in oil, as you can see on my finger. Back in the workshop. Under the hood is a feat of engineering, exemplified by the sideways mounted engine. Extremely innovative for the time. It created more space for crew and cargo. A lot was packed into a small space here. It's very tight. You have to turn a thousand corners in order to get to a place where you need to make a repair. The tank's impressive age makes things more difficult. Most of the tanks were built here, at the Chelyabinsk tractor plant. Today, Ural Vagonsavod one of the world's largest tank manufacturers. Nikolai Molodnyakov is one of the engineers who designed the T-55. Western countries didn't stop producing tanks after World War II. Hence the great effort here to design a next-generation tank that would set new standards in every way. The T-55 made its first public appearance in 1958 at the annual Victory Day Parade in Moscow. In contrast to its predecessor, the T-54, the T-55 has better armor, a stronger engine, a wider range of fire, infrared aiming, and it was one of the first tanks ever to have an automatic nuclear weapon protection system. One of the requirements for this tank, and this was the mentality of the time, was that the crew had to be able to repair it right there on the battlefield. The engineers made this possible. And that's why the T-55 is so long-lived and is still being used today. In the following decades, the T-55 has proven itself in several military conflicts all over the world, among others in Vietnam and Afghanistan. Thanks to its simple basic design, it was very easy to take apart and repair. Only one thing is necessary, strength. Some of the thickly armored plates weigh several hundred kilograms. In Benekenstein, Mario Tensa and Marcel Koenig search for the problem in their malfunctioning T-55, originally built in 1972. Look there, it's dripping. A small leak in the hose can bring even the most produced tank in the world to its knees. It's not so bad. It's not the hydraulic reservoir like we initially thought, but rather the hose behind it. We can see it now that we've taken it apart. It's a piece of cake to repair. Ultimately, no tank was in use more frequently than the T-54-55. The next ultimate vehicle is also a commercial success. Thanks to its exceptional features, it is already being used in seven countries. Hardly any combat vehicle is as versatile as this one. The CV-90 Infantry Fighting Vehicle. Equipped with a superb chassis, 
state-of-the-art systems and powerful weapons, it is the most modern of its kind. Since series production began in 1993, a total of 1,280 vehicles in the CV-90 family have been built. To date, 15 different models of the CV-90 are in use in seven countries. Sittermorn in northern Norway. Sittermorn Military Camp, home of the 1st Battalion. In total, the Norwegian Army has 144 of these infantry fighting vehicles, which differ from CV-90s used in other countries above all with respect to weapons and drive systems. All models of the CV-90 family have the same basic platform, but their final design varies depending on the countries that use them and the locations where they are to be deployed. On today's program in Setamon, a combat exercise for the CV-90 crews. Company commander Peter Bakayord explains the assignment in the briefing. They've been ordered to do uh, pre-combat checks on their vehicles and their personal equipment uh, and they will be handed out live ammunition and then they will head out to the live fire area. The mission, to drive five kilometers in tactical formation to the firing range in the mountains and there to engage various targets. In addition to the main weapons and the machine gun, the Norwegian CV-90s have a remote controlled weapon station on the roof with a thermal camera and a target laser. They also differ from most other tanks in that they drive on rubber tracks. These cause less vibration and are thus gentler on the sensitive technology. Matthias Sorensen has commanded the CV-90 for two years. I like to compare the CV-90 to uh, a multi-tool uh, because it fits pretty much any mission. It has uh, the armor, it has the mobility, it has the weapons like the cannon, the machine gun, the remote weapon system where you are able to mount the different we weapons and um, you have the soldiers in the comp compartment who can fight along the vehicle. So uh, together we are able to defeat any enemy. As an infantry fighting vehicle, the CV-90 offers space in the back for eight infantry soldiers. The middle contains seats for the commander and the gunner, as well as the weapon system. In front are the driver's seat and the engine. Once preparations have been finished, the driver starts the 810 horsepower V12 engine. As an infantry fighting vehicle, the CV-90 brings infantry soldiers to their field location and then supports them in combat. In addition, the 34-ton vehicle has excellent driving features. It can reach a high speed of 70 km an hour and climb slopes with a grade of up to 60%. In the 1990s, Norway became the second country after Sweden to decide to use the CV-90. In 2012, it increased its number of vehicles up to 144. Major Per Rune Hansen is the technical project leader for the CV-90 in the Norwegian military. All the armored infantry fighting vehicles have more or less the same uh, firepower or the protection, but uh, it was the mobility that was really important for us. The CV-90 was designed in the 1980s for the Swedish military by the defense contractor Heglunds, today BAE Systems. The vehicle was supposed to feature high tactical and strategic mobility, to be able to engage a variety of targets and offer large potential for growth. We had compared with the vehicles that we had in the 90s, the vehicle looked quite the same, but it's a whole new different vehicle. We got rubber tracks on it, which reduces the fatigue on the people in the combat compartment. We got a remote weapon station and we have an integrated uh, BMS system also, which allows it to be an easier situation for the commander. And the manufacturer continually develops new systems. 
one of them an active suspension based on a Formula One car. Sensors monitor the terrain as well as the vehicle's speed and acceleration. In milliseconds, the onboard computer uses that information to calculate the optimal counterforce to be provided by the shock absorbers and vibration absorbers, adjusting it automatically. In this way, the vehicle's chassis is raised and kept level. This minimizes the stress on the technology and the crew. Initial test videos show how the system works. For the time being, the new suspension is still in the test phase, but it could be built into all existing models. Meanwhile, the soldiers have arrived at the live fire area. Before shooting, the crews must check all the weapon systems. It is part of the exercise. In order for everything to run smoothly in an emergency, they must consistently train all standard operations. If we are doing a good job here, we are also more precise when we drive and, uh, and when we are going to shoot later. The most important element, the sight. It has an integrated daytime and thermal imaging system, as well as a laser rangefinder. Now we're making sure that the shooter is on the target. Uh, and with this, we can see. The so-called sight checker lets driver Kim Nordanger see whether the sight and the gun are properly synchronized. Today, they are using practice ammunition, called cold ammunition which does not explode upon impact. Now, the exercise begins. So that everything can be monitored from the inside during a mission, the CV-90 has a digital battle management system. Color screens display all relevant information for the commander, such as a map showing the location of friendly and foreign troops. Since today's exercise is purely focused on target practice, orders are radioed in from the company commander. The CV-90 can fire from a 30mm gun, 7.62mm coax machine gun or a variety of weapons from the remote weapon station. The crew's final exercise. Three targets at a distance of about 1500 meters. All the rounds are dead on target, center, center. Uh, so they're doing the job right. They've uh, done the small things very good. And that's very important, do all the procedures correct. And uh, the rounds hit the target. It is not only the soldiers who have made a good impression during this training exercise. The CV-90 has also once again shown why it is an ultimate vehicle.